later and now i have with me my friend of whom i was a reserve in mr lazar berman who is going to speak to us on the changing character of conflict imperatives of transformation i took assurance from him that he'll take 20 minutes yeah berman hmm? 20 minutes less even okay uh it's 12:10 so i guess i can say uh good afternoon and my name is laser berman i'm from the jerusalem institute for strategy and security um so i'd like to first thank our hosts in the indian defense force and the center for uh, land warfare studies and to my esteemed panelists it's quite an honor to be here and i was asked to talk about the ch the changing character of conflict and i see a, a challenge in in that uh in that topic first of all i'm in a room with scholars and war fighters and i'm sure everyone here has thought long and hard about military and in innovation and transformation and second some of my colleagues who will be speaking later today and tomorrow are going to drill down into some of the specifics of the cyber information ai proxy warfare so what i want to do today um and hopefully i can fit this into the 20 minutes and i will is set the stage for the f further discussions and then i want to take a self critical look at an israel defense force case study um and use that as one reference for our further discussions and i promise you that the idf has done some wonderful things but here i'm going to be somewhat critical um so we can understand what the need was in israel at least um for the transformation so just very briefly what are we talking about when we're talking about military military transformation there's um definitions all over the place but they usually talk about certain things and it's not just technology it's changing the organization is changing or operational concepts if there's no change in the organization then i would not say the real uh transformation has taken place and there's other terms that are basically talking about the same idea we hear rma um in israel united states and elsewhere offset strategies and that's all talking about the same type of um transformation now why is transformation important and that might be a strange question to some people since we're talking about it all the time and we're somewhat addicted to the word transformation um i wouldn't say that everyone needs to transform first of all if you are relevant to the threats that you're facing a transformation is expensive it's risky uh you might get caught in the middle of it so not all transformation is positive however we are talking about a competition it, you're not the only organization out there whether it's business or the military there's a learning competition and if indeed you are learning in this competition and you're becoming less and less relevant the price can be painful it can often be catastrophic so we have a military example that's the 2006 Lebanon war and I'll talk about that in depth in a little bit and also in the business field so this chart is from the United States steel mills which were dominated by these massive integrated mills and in time these smaller uh, electric up electric operated mills entered the market at the lowest end of the market producing basically melting uh, scrap metal from junkyards and they slowly drove these huge uh massive rich established uh integrated steel mills out of the market which is should be a warning for us because we come from large organizations many of us have been dealing with much smaller armed actors and they can drive us out if we don't recognize the need to transform and if we are not able to transform so how is this done this is a uh, conceptual sketch to hopefully um give some of the idea of the way I'm looking at this if you look at the diagram on the left we have a concept and that concept initially is pretty close to reality it can never be exactly right but it's good enough and there are small surprises and in time reality changes it could be because the enemy decides to change it could be technology but there's a change in the environment and because we're human beings and we don't like to change our basic beliefs we start stretching our current concepts as much as they can and we tell ourselves that everything's fine we make small adaptations and we tell us we're good we're still relevant and in time there's bigger and bigger surprises and you see that gap what i call the relevance gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger until there's a major surprise that we can't ignore anymore so you can think about september 11th for other, for us we can talk about the yom kippur war we can talk about the 2006 war i'm sure every organization here can think about a painful surprise when we understood that our current concept does not match reality and we're paying the price for it and even then there's a process of denial but at some point we learn we transform and we are forced to bring ourselves co closer to reality now ideally we'd be able to do what's on the right which is we can decide 
that we have an opportunity to bring a change and to make the enemy less relevant and to surprise him. Now, I think the one on the left is much more common, much unfortunately, that's what we see more and more. But I think some of what we're trying to do here in this conference is to understand where we see opportunities to uh, surprise the enemy and extend that period of advantage. Now, hopefully you can read this, and if not, uh, I, can, I can give it to you after. But if we're just going to set the framework for the history of military revolutions, um, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of these terms, but we see a series of military revolutions based on civilian technology. Eventually, these revolutions are caught up, uh, the enemy catches up to them, and they get stuck, and there's a need for a new revolution. So if we talk about the first revolution, um, that's the era of the locomotive, um, steel, early electricity. That era of that um, mass armies, you can think about the Civil War to World War I, um, strategic mobility, that was the name of the game um, in that period, and the creation of, of massive headquarters to manage all this. That worked well until World War I, I would say, that Revolution 1.0 got stuck. And where everyone was an excellent 1.0 industrial army, there was an understanding that there needed to be a change because we couldn't go along in the same way that we had before. So there were different ideas that came out, strategic bombing as a way to bypass the battlefield. But as we know, the Germans did it the best with their uh, concept of what became Blitzkrieg, taking advantage of the internal combustion engine, transistor radio, electricity, going from strategic mobility and bringing tactical mobility to the battlefield, and the focus of that kind of war is at the operational level. That kind of warfare focuses on platforms, so tanks, planes, excellence and platforms, and there was a period where that was the name of the game there. You build better platforms, uh, you try to outdo your enemy in number and quality. Now that gets stuck for the um, United States and NATO, when they look after the Vietnam War, they look at uh, the Soviet bloc and they say, with these numbers and the amount of casualties, the number of casualties that it'll take in that type of warfare, we're not willing to do that. And they start looking toward what? The civilian technology that's emerging, microprocessors, personal computers, internet, and that leads to the intelligent, the information technology revolution, the RMA 3.0, um, which brought uh, a neutralization of platforms. So tanks, planes were much more vulnerable, less relevant, but there was a cost. If we're talking about land, for, land warfare, most of the good stuff that came out of that, most of the really, um, the bigger budgets and the really uh, cutting edge technology went to air forces, it went, excuse me, it went to intelligence, and land warfare and armies uh, enjoyed much less of it. Now we can say that 3.0, as in the pattern, is getting stuck again. Our enemies, if we look at them, whether they're state actors, Russia and China, are certainly taking advantage of the IT RMA. I think there's no question about that. And even sub-state actors, and I'll talk about that, are also taking advantage in terms of developing precision fires, um, drones to direct those fires, and all the things that made make our platforms vulnerable, um, they're achieving and they're achieving it quickly. Which means, since 3.0 is stuck, we have to look at emerging civilian technologies. And those are the things that some of my colleagues have spoken about and will speak about, AI, robotics, um, big data, and the like. Now, I want to take a look at how that has affected our case study here of the IDF and we'll understand the need for transformation. So these are some of the wars and the major operations that the IDF had been through. The IDF, Israel made a wonderful 2.0 military based on tanks and an air force, and that military was relevant in 1956, 67, uh, 70, and then we get to 1973 and our 2.0 gets stuck. Why? Because the Syrians and especially the Egyptians moved away from depending on platforms and they depended on making our platforms vulnerable. Sagar, Sagar missiles, SAMs, and we paid a huge price for not recognizing this in terms of um, our maneuver getting stuck. And at the same time, when it was 2.0 against 2.0, the IDF did what it wanted with Egyptian tanks, with Egyptian planes, but it was those non-platform threats uh, that really um, got us stuck. So we looked around and we also took advantage of what was going on in the West and we developed our own RMA and that was very relevant. If you think about the Lebanon War, Operation Mole Cricket 19 where we destroyed the Syrian Samurai. Um, but that, at the same time there was a price. Again, all of the budget or the bulk of the budget and the bulk of the technology went to the Air Force and went to the ISR and did not go to the ground forces. 
And Israel moved away from ground maneuver, which had been our bread and butter in the past, and which, what, which is what brought us uh, victory in the past. So if you look at countability, uh, grapes of wrath, there was no maneuver at all. Defensive shield is, is an exception. And then when we understood that we need to go back to maneuver, the maneuver was not very firm and it was not very impressive. So Lebanon 2, 2006, kind of this halting maneuver at the end that didn't accomplish much. And if you look at the Gaza campaigns around, there's some maneuver, but it's after a long uh, campaign of bombing and air strikes. Now, we're res less relevant. Our 3.0 isn't covering anymore. If I can describe it, I'll say we're trying to stretch 3.0 as much as possible. We're trying to get better and better and more precise with our 3.0, but it's not working. When was the last time we won a war? I would say 2006, we certainly didn't. The Gaza operations, I would say, if we had won them, we wouldn't have to fight the next one. And you wouldn't read in the news all the time that they're still shooting at us. And at the same time, Hamas and Hezbollah are getting stronger. So this is a sign that we're still going with the same concept and trying to stretch it, but reality is moving over here. And we're in for a surprise. So the relevance gap, we can say we're paying more, right? The, excuse me, the budgets are getting higher and higher. Um, our enemies are growing stronger. Our platforms are going more expensive. We're investing more and more into the same platforms. We talked about earlier types of warfare based on platforms. And ground maneuver is still in crisis, and we haven't yet solved that. So if you look at one of these big surprises, the Second Lebanon War, our enemies were not able to sh destroy a lot of tanks. They weren't able to destroy planes. But they were able to stop the biggest air assault in Israeli history at the very end of the war, Operation Changing Direction 11. And even tanks, it was shocking. You had uh, infantry officers walking and looking at these tanks and you know, the Israeli conception of the tank as the thing that wins wars. We saw that Hezbollah is destroying our tanks now and stopping Israeli maneuver in its tracks. So the relevance gap, if I would describe it today, we have a strategic challenge of enemies who are able to take advantage of the proliferation of new technologies. They're transforming from very good terrorist organizations to basically a near-peer adversary, kind of what NATO forces are looking at in Russia. Obviously, different levels because everything's smaller, but they're able to do their own aid to AD to us. And they're even talking about limited offensive into Israel while denying access to the IDF into their territory to give them enough time uh, to strike the Israeli home front. And on the battlefield, it's an enemy that disappears, that sees us before we see them and that are able to not stop our maneuver, but wear it down and take a high price, which makes us think twice about doing it. So we call this the adversary A2AD. Um, so our 3.0 is stuck. And this is the reason why, for us, there is a need for transformation. Again, this is context, context relevant. So every army will have their own threat. But I'm saying for the Israeli one, I think this quote from General Kobe Barak, who was the ground forces commander, is very relevant. We're getting better at 3.0. We've improved our strike ac accuracy from eight digit coordinates to tw 10, 12, 14, even 15. We can hit any coordinate you want, but that does not mean we're destroying the enemy because it's no longer a question of hitting a precise spot if the enemy is not there anymore and he's able uh, to avoid our detection. So as I said before, if, if we look at, excuse me, if we look at this relevance gap, um, I would say we are, have not, we are at the stage of recognition right now, and we are going through uh, the beginning of learning and transformation. So we're, what we're trying to do with our transformation, we want to be able to see first on ground, for, ground warfare, we want to be able to strike force, and that is all in the interest of restoring tactical mobility, like was done in World War II. Uh, we have to bring tactical mobility back to the land battlefield. Now, we do have some advantages there. Stealth enemy is usually more vulnerable to new sensor technologies. If you take the advantage, the case study of World War II German U-boats, they had basically maxed out their abilities. They had an advantage in all the, almost all of the, of the new technology that came out was advantage Britain, advantage US, advantage the Allies. So we are going to be able to take advantage of new uh, technologies to find those stealth enemies. We obviously have a greater access to technology than non-state enemies. And uh, we have great ability to develop weapon systems based on them. So we do have advantages here. There's a question of who should lead the transformation. Our services and services in general are pretty good at, at um, right, two minutes, um, at uh, innovating against challenges 
that are their problems. But when problems fall between the services, it's usually much harder. So you look at, look at the very serious tunnel threat from the Gaza Strip, that kind of fell between services. Is it land? Is it air? Is it intelligence? And it was hard for a service specifically to come up with uh, solutions for it. And if you look at the Russian green, green men, that's also a problem that falls between services. So what we're looking at in Israel now is joint-led transformation. We've understood that the joint level, um, the general staff is too weak, in, not weak, but they're not effective enough in, um, in leading transformation. So the current chief of staff, of staff Kohavi, is trying to strengthen uh, the joint level with new organizations that will be able to manage uh, innovation, transformation that falls between the service cracks. So you have two major developments, the Shiloh Brigade and a multi-domain brigade. And I see a problem that uh, ex, uh, Air Force personnel are leading a lot of these organizations, which might mean we're still looking at 3.0 air warfare. Um, we'll skip that. So key lessons here. We have to ask, are we still relevant against our threats? Are we just stretching old concepts to solve new problems, or are we really coming up with new concepts? Real change means a change in the organization, like we're starting to see in the IDF general staff. Not all change is going to be helpful. We have to remember that just because it's new doesn't, doesn't mean it's good. And we have to understand what the role of the services in, in, is, is in these changes, and can they solve all of our problems. And I'll finish with a quote uh, from Ben Gorion when he ch changed the IDF from a territorial army into a maneuver army. He, he called it shattering the dishes, um, and he said it was hard. Even though the security apparatus had worked for years, it no longer fit. Um, and even the revolutionaries were against it. He said even the rev revolutionaries were at, at their core devoted conservatives, and they worshipped the shell even when the inside was empty. So that was his metaphor for what the early IDF was as a territorial army. We have to stop worshipping the shell. We have to make sure that the content is relevant to the threat. And we have to make sure that even if we call ourselves revolutionaries, we're not uh, really conservatives inside. So thank you very much, and I look forward to questions at the end. I think Mr. Berman has set uh, the stage, as he was saying, to suggest. But the changes in organizations, he suggests, are imperative. Unless we have changes in organization, you, he feels that transformation has actually not taken place. But in the lessons learned, he mentions that not all changes actually result in good uh, effectiveness. He also sp spoke about the relevance gap and why we should be looking at the opportunities to surprise the enemy. Uh, of course, he did talk about the historical uh, framework of military transformation. And the center of gravity in that he spoke about is the military organizations. I think a lot of uh, emphasis has been given by him on the maneuver space. And that's the uh, center of gravity. And he, of course, gave an example of the uh, IDF wars, right, starting from 1948. And I would say that uh, he did give particularly about the second Israel-Lebanon war of 2006, in which he found that the adversary was totally in an unconventional mode. So I, th I think it was a very nice lesson that he has brought out as to what he looks at, what we need to do, see first, strike first, and move on. With that, I think I'll now